Praise the Lord, everyone. Praise the name of the Lord. So good to be in the house of the Lord on such a beautiful Sunday morning. Happy to be here. A few, few announcements. Uh, um, if you are doing the quarter folder fundraiser, please turn that in to Sister Williams by May 1st. Or we're in April, so it's next Sunday. Um, if you have a child in the nursery, please pick them up as soon as possible, or as soon as service is dismissed. Um, we don't want to leave them in there, and everybody else wants to get home just like we do. So let's go pick up our kids. Layla, you got to stop playing over in the nursery. It's causing issues. All right, let's see what else. Mother's Day banquet is April 30th at 1 p.m., and I'm assuming that's here at the church fellowship hall. If you have any questions about that, please get to the bishop. And uh, our kids coach would like to have Job come, and I'm going to not be missing so many Wednesday nights and things of that nature, but I have been working upwards of 62, 63 hours a week, and I haven't been able to make it on Wednesday nights, and we traveled uh, last Sunday. Uh, my uh, One of the interns I graduated with in Alexandria got married. part of that, so that's where we were at last Sunday, and uh, we were actually going to come back, we were actually going to be back Sunday, um, but Mariah got food poisoning, and uh, we actually got stuck in St. Louis, Missouri for two nights because we couldn't drive, we couldn't get to St. Louis, and it was miserable, I will say, we were lady slaves, and we had to watch Layla and and the kids parents, Um, but it's all right, we made it back, so we're home. All right, let's see. Prayer request this morning. Uh, Missionary Steve Phelps to Uganda. And we need to remember Brother and Sister Griffin this morning. And uh, I'm going to assume it's probably the Lord needing to touch their bodies and touch their minds this morning and keep them safe. Uh, Are there other any other prayer requests? for the things that you have done, O God. Lord Jesus, you see each and every need that was called out in this place this morning, God. Lord, you see each and every family situation that needs a touch from your hand this morning, God. Lord, you see each and every broken heart, O God, Lord, that needs a touch from your spirit, O God. Lord, you see Sister Bishop this morning, God. We lift her up to you, God. Lord, you see Marilyn this morning, God. Lord, we pray that you would touch her, God. And Lord, I pray right now in the name of Jesus, God, that you would touch Sister Rebecca's need for a job, God, I pray now, God, uh, Lord, that you would start working all things together, oh God, uh, Lord, for her good in the name of Jesus Christ, oh God. Lord, open up your word to us this morning, God. Lord, speak to us today, God. Anoint us in this place, oh God. Uh, Lord, give us a touch from heaven today, God, and we ask it in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. And everyone said, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, amen. Today, I want to, I like, I like to pull things out of scripture that are fun to look at, that are, you know, not so, I don't know, maybe just surface area, and I really search for things to, to, to teach, and, and obviously I pray, and I, and 
my study, but in studying this week, um, I, I, I found something new, and that is you can actually teach or see salvation in the first ten verses of the book of Genesis. You can fully go through the new birth experience salvation's plan in the first ten verses of Genesis. And I, and I just want to talk about that this morning and uh, just label it salvation through creation. Um, Paul was writing, and I'm, I'm going to lay some foundation before we actually start looking at some of our key verses, so I'm not going to have a verse I was going to turn to immediately. Um, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul went into this long discourse uh, to the Corinthian church about some of the things that the children of Israel had went through in the Old Testament, how that they had wandered in the desert, and how that they had uh, faced so many trials and so many things, and how God had always brought them through. And in 1 Corinthians 10, uh, verse 11, Paul ends kind of what he was talking about. He said, now all these things happened unto them for examples, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Paul was saying that everything that was written, everything that is taught, everything that had happened in the Old Testament, he was talking specifically about some of the situations um, from the children of Israel, but in the total context, we can take anything from the Old Testament, and it was written for our admonition. From the beginning of God's plan, he has always purposed that there was going to be a group of people who would serve him. There was always going to be an elect group that he chose, and in return, they chose him. Looking in the book of Genesis, and specifically in chapter 1 today, there are several, several types of Christ, who was the Savior, and basically a type, okay, so we know what types and shadows are, but the type of that is, a type is a divinely purposed um, illustration or example of an eternal truth. So it is no wonder that in the very first uh, verse of the Bible that we can find uh, Jesus Christ. In John 5, 39... Uh, Jesus speaking, he said, Search the scriptures, for in them think ye ye have eternal life. And they are they which testify of me. So the first five words of our beloved Bible is, In the beginning God created. Now the Apostle John, um, who wrote the gospel of the book of John, um, John is actually one of my, uh, if I had to pick one of my favorite Gospels, it would be the book of John. And that's because John's purpose in writing his Gospel was to simply um, expound on who Jesus Christ really was. To read the first chapter of John is such a powerful thing. And in your own studying, I would encourage you one time, it's, it's very interesting to read the first chapter of Genesis and then go and read the first chapter of John. It is amazing how they are almost identical in what they are saying. It, it truly is uh, uh, an amazing thing. Um, but John um, wrote his book specifically to show us who Jesus Christ really was. God moved on him to really give us an understanding of the totality of of who Christ was. And as oneness Pentecostals, our favorite, some of our favorite scriptures are found here, which is John 1 and 1 and John 1 and 14, but the Bible just states it so eloquently here. And that was, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then in verse 14 it expounds and says, and that Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. So in the beginning was the Word. What it was talking about was God and His will was in the very beginning. His will. So it says, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. God and His will are the same thing. 
Um, if you are to say, uh, uh, I am Taylor, okay? And as Taylor, as a man, um, I have my own desires. I have my own things that I like. I like driving a black car. You might like driving a blue car. I like, uh, you know, I like spaghetti. It's one of my favorite foods. You like fried chicken. There are things that make you who you are, and there are things that make me who I am. So I am Taylor, and I have my will. That is what John 1 and 1 was saying here, was in the beginning was the will of God. The will of God was God, and it, it, it's who he was. But that will, the word, was made flesh, and it dwelt among us. Jesus Christ was the God that was in the beginning, and he dwelt among us. Jesus was the God-man. He was divine, and he was human. And as such, Jesus was the one that spoke creation into existence. Isaiah 44 and 24 says, um, Thus saith the Lord, thy Redeemer, and he that hath formed thee from the womb, I am the Lord, that maketh all things, that stretcheth forth the heavens alone. Everyone say alone. One, alone I created everything. And John 1 and 10 says he was in the world, talking about Jesus, and the world was made by him. So, people who have a confusion about the Godhead and say that there are three separate persons with three separate wills, just you cannot prove it in Scripture. Because Isaiah, it was Jehovah of the Old Testament saying that I stretched forth the heavens by myself. But then we read in John that he was in the world talking about Jesus Christ and the world was made by him. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. And the reason that is important is because Jesus' main purpose was to bring salvation to his people. So when we read things in the Old Testament, they can always point if we will look to the new birth or salvation experience. Now, in studying Genesis, you will find that there was two types of creative power that went forth in Genesis. Two types of creative power that went forth. The first one is found in Genesis 1 and 1. In the beginning, God created, meaning that he literally created something out of nothing. He took something, and or he took nothing, and he put something there. So he created. He made something new, something that was not there before. But there was also a second part to his creation, and it is very, very, very important for us to understand this. And that's found in Genesis 1 and 7. Brother Mark does such an awesome job keeping up with me on that. He really does. Genesis 1 and 7 says, And God made the firmament. Everyone say, made. The word made means he formed something out of something that already existed. So we see that God created, which means he took nothing and he put something there, but then God also did another creative work, which is that he made. He took what he had created, and he began to form it and to shape it into his purpose. God's first creative act gave him the raw material to use. It gave him something to work with. But the second creative act was that he fashioned this raw material. He took this great abyss and he created a sky and he created the land and, and he created the ocean and he created the animals and then eventually he got to creating the uh, or mankind. A part of this making or a part of this creation that he was doing was that he divided the dry land from the waters and he caused light to shine out of darkness. So in the type and shadows that we're seeing here in creation was God's first creative act was in Genesis 1 and 1 and 2. And it says, and the earth was without form and void. 
So, yes, God had created the earth, but it was nothing. It was of no use to him. He, he could not simply stop at just creating the world because, obviously, he was creating it for us, and he had to create it into something that we could live in. Now, the Bible says that God is the, the he creates human life. Before uh, we were ever known, he was forming us in the womb, or he had formed us in the womb. He created us. But when we come into this world in our naturally created state, we are exactly like the original creation. We are void. We are unusable. We are in a raw state. When we are born, the Bible says that we are born in to sin. Man is such, uh, just to be honest with you, not trying to hurt your feelings or mine this morning, but in ourselves, we are just horribly evil beings. We really, really are. Without the Spirit of God, we are simply void of anything good, anything righteous, and anything holy. We sing so many songs about the holiness of God. And, and, and to give you a little bit of understanding, and I've talked about it before, but it's when we cry holy, we're saying, God, you are literally something that no one or nothing else is. There's a lot of powerful people in this world. There is. There's a lot of people who have prestige. There's a lot of people who can change lives by programs and by things uh, of that nature. But there is only one thing in existence that is holy, and that is Jesus Christ. He is holy, and in our natural state, we are the opposite. Preaching tonight, and I was going to use this in my example tonight, and I still might, so y'all just roll with me tonight. But you can now walk into our local Target on Sam Ridley, and I can now walk into the ladies' uh, restroom with no filters, no checks. I can just simply walk in there. And if I'm questioned, all I have to do is say, I identify myself as a woman. And uh, a, a lady can walk right into the men's restroom, and if she's questioned or asked, all she has to simply say is, I identify myself as a man. Creation in itself is a mess. It's chaos. Without the truth of God's word and the holding of his spirit, we are simply a mess. Now, the thing about God's Word and God's Spirit is God's Spirit does not keep us from sin. It is the Word of God that keeps us from sin. The Spirit of God will bring the Word of God, and it will quicken it in our spirit. But it is His Word that we hide in His heart that we might not sin against Him. It's the Spirit of God that quickens that Word. Romans, uh, or Jeremiah 17 and 9, talking about the natural state of a man, says the heart is deceitful above all things. Our heart, which is the center of our emotions, is deceitful above everything. And not only is our emotions, the heart, deceitful, the Bible says it is desperately wicked, desperately wicked, and who can know it save God, which is why it is so, so critically important that we're able to get down before God and we're able to let him search our hearts and to cleanse what is not right and to move things around and to bring forth good fruit from our heart. The last passage of scripture I'm going to read on the natural carnal state of man is in Romans 3, 10 through 18. It says, As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, which is uh, an old English word for snakes, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace have they not known. 
Let me tell you, people who are living in sin and they are proud about it, they've never known peace because there is no peace in sin. People might say that they're doing exactly what they want to do and they might say that they're feeling good and this is all right, but they do not know peace because peace comes from one thing and that is the Prince of Peace and His name is Jesus Christ and as long as we're dwelling in sin and we're doing it proudly, we will never know true peace. It is us in our natural, unregenerated state. The Bible says that darkness was upon the face of the deep. This world that we live in, they're in utter darkness. They are in utter darkness. They have no no direction for anything. People cannot be married. People cannot properly uh, uh, raise their children. People cannot do anything because darkness is on us in our original created state. But there is good news as we read on in this creation story. You see John 1 and 9. Notice how much I've been in John chapter 1 this morning. But it's literally, I'm, I'm really asking you in your, in your reading this week. I've never asked my Sunday school class to go read something. But read Genesis 1 and go read John 1. The revelation that God will give you will just be incredible. But anyway, darkness was upon the face of the deep. But you see in John 1 and 9, it says, That was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Jesus Christ is the only light that can separate the darkness. Because it says, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. But boy, we should all get Holy Ghost bumps right here. But it says, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the water. In its original created state, it was void. It was darkness. That's what the Bible was describing creation as. And likewise, in our original state, we are void. We are in darkness. We have, we're not usable for the Master. We, we have no purpose. But when the Spirit of God moves upon the face of the darkness, when the Spirit of God moves over what is chaos, He brings purpose. Now, I believe to teach something or to teach a doctrine... And I will always say this, but I believe that you have to have the mouth of two or three witnesses. There is not anything that you can teach unless you have two scriptures to prove what you are trying to teach. I talked about a little earlier in 1 Corinthians how Paul had uh, talked about some of the accounts in the Old Testament and said that they're for admonition, they're for um, our good, for our benefit. But in the second letter that he wrote to Corinthians, we see a direct parallel that Paul makes between the creation in the book of Genesis and uh, the new birth or the salvation experience. And that's in 2 Corinthians 4 and 6. I got my brother giving that to us so we can read it together here. <clears throat> that's all right, I'll read it. 2 Corinthians 4 and 6, it says, For God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, talking about creation. He, he saw the darkness, and he simply commanded the light to shine. He sa it says, hath shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So, the first act of creation, the first act would be us being created in our raw original state, but we can look to the second act of creation, and that's, yes, we're going to be born into this world, and we were born, and we were evil, and we were ungenerated, and we had no purpose, but it's when God starts to make things in our lives. It's when God takes the, the, the chaos, and he begins to say, okay, light and day, you can't stay together anymore. You have to separate and it says land and water, you can't be together anymore. You have to separate. And let me just say something right now. There is a difference between a man and a woman. And I'm not saying this on some prideful kick, and I'm not trying to get a bunch of Christians to nod your head, but a man can never do what a woman can do, not naturally and not spiritually. And a woman can never do what a man can do in the natural or in the spiritual realm. God said, man, you have to be man, and woman, you have to be woman. 
And he also says, sin, you have to stay over here, and righteousness, you have to stay over here. We can stay in our original state if we want to, but if we'll let the Spirit of God move upon the face of the waters, if we'll let him fill the void that he first created, he can make something beautiful. He can make something that the whole world can look at and say, wow, look at that. He makes us. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory in the face of Jesus Christ. You see, when we receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, we, you're, in, you're bound to sin. You're bound in darkness. But when you receive the Spirit of God, you have to understand that you're getting all of the characteristics of God. And that means when God, in His creative state, in the beginning, when he began to speak light into darkness, that gives God the ability when we're going through dark situations in our lives, when we go to him, he can speak light into our dark situations. And when we're going through things and, 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 and we don't really understand the purpose and we don't really, it don't really make sense to us, we can go to the creator and say, God, how did you design this to be? I'm very, very big on how God designed things to be. Because we live in a different time now and everyone, everyone's got their own opinion. Yeah, all of you got your own opinion. I've got my own opinion. But I try, and I'm not being holier than thou, but I'm just saying I try, I know you try to, to base my opinions around what his opinions are. I, I, he knows everything. He has more wisdom than I could ever have. So I try to base things around how it was supposed to be naturally. I mean, just, just in a, a basic example, I know... Uh, there's half of you in here who think it's okay if your baby sleeps in the bed with you, and then there's the other half in here who say, mm -hmm. but to me, when I think about how God created it naturally thousands of years ago when we didn't have different rooms and we didn't have beds, babies slept with their mothers. And so I think that for a time, I don't think that there's anything wrong with a, with a baby sleeping with their mother because there's certain things that we have to go back to and look at naturally. Look at naturally. But there's also things that we have to let God form in us. There are certain desires in a man or a woman who we cannot, we cannot let them just sit idle. We cannot let them just sit unchanged. I don't want to go, I won't go as crazy to say God's going to make a major change in your life every day because anybody who tells you that really doesn't, God's not like that. He's the master potter and, and a potter doesn't just bang the, the, the clay every day, and it, it does slow changes. It, it's trying to make something beautiful, but I don't want to go longer than one week without God changing something in my life. There's got to be something in my life this coming week that He can change, that He can move, that He can move more toward His glory. The second act of creation. You see, He took what was chaotic, He took what was a mess, and He brought order to it. 2 Corinthians 5 and 17. Very, very interesting, the wordage that Paul used here. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. If you look at creature and you look at creation, those words have the same root, which means that when we become in Christ, we are a completely new creation. I was Taylor Douglas Little before I received the baptism of God and I surrendered my life to him. But when I surrendered my life to him, I was a completely different creation. It is one of the most awesome things to see someone receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because they will go down to the altar physically looking one way. But when they walk away from that altar, they physically look different because they are a new creation. God has just done a miraculous work in their life. Now here's where I have a problem with people saying that we can be saved by shaking some man's hand. Because there's no miracle in that. There's no creative power in that. Me repeating a prayer or repeating after some man, there's no creative power in that. You see, when you read the book of Genesis, Everything that was happening was miraculous. 
It was the hand of God. It was the workmanship of God. And it's the same way with salvation and with our life. It's not something you and I can fabricate. It's not something we can set up some ritual. Now, God has given us steps to walk people through salvation, and that's fine and dandy. But there is a threshold. You can only take someone so far into receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost where God has to come up and he has to take control. And it has to be a completely different creative work. Because when we get in Christ, we are a new creature. Old things are passed away. Thank you, Lord. And behold, all things are become new. All things are become new. The reason Jesus gave us parables about those virgins who didn't have enough oil to keep their lamps burning is because if we go and we run off old oil, we stay an old creation. Every time the Spirit of God... Now, there are times where you can speak in tongues and you can move in the Holy Ghost, and not necessarily a transforming work has happened, but there should be times in our prayer life where the Holy Ghost comes and again makes us a new creation. Where we get down and we lay down our, 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 uh, our opinions and we lay down our will and we say, God, not my will, but your will be done. And, and God, if this is not pleasing you, give me the strength to change it and we should get up a new creation because you can't walk through this world and stay the same creature. You have to let the Creator change us. Ephesians 2 and 10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath or before ordained that we should walk in them. Here is, here's the crux of the matter in 1 Corinthians 15 and 22. And I'm trying to help you. I'm trying to give you something. And we should share this message in love. This is not a message we share in hate. This is not a message that we share in, in oh, I have the truth, and oh, you don't, and oh, no, I'm just ready to, to smack you down with the truth of salvation. No, no, this is to really help those people who really are convinced that they don't have to really have a creative act for salvation. Because you, when you look at Genesis, it was simply an act of God. It was an act of a miracle. Would you get up uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 15 and 22 for me, brother? So we're talking about the first act of creation, which is when God creates things and he puts them in their natural states. He puts them in their uh, uh, original state. And then there's the making. There's the made. 1 Corinthians 15 and 22 lays out what's going to happen if we stay in our original state. For as in Adam, the first Adam, okay, we got the first Adam, all die. If we stay with the first Adam and we're never regenerated, you're not only going to die physically, but there is a much, much greater death than a physical death. And that's in a hundred years when we're all in the same place in the ground, we're not going to be maybe in the same place because there's a spiritual death which is much greater. And if we stay with the first Adam, the first creation, all die. But even so in Christ, the second Adam, the second creation, the one who was made in the image of God shall be made alive. What an opportunity that God has given us that if we will choose to let him move upon our lives and not just on Sundays and not just in the dire situations of our life. And I know life gets hectic and I repent so many times when I go to God that I'm not able to go to him more and that I'm not able to pray more. Now, it's not God's will for us to live in self-condemnation because you're never going to be able to pray enough. I hope you understand. You're never going to be able to to fast enough, but there is a healthy level of responsibility to the to the relationship that we should have, and and so many times we go to God only when we just we, we just really are at our our end, or we're really just at our point when, in all reality, we should always be letting the Spirit of God move upon the voids of our heart. If we are lonely, if we are going through situations that we don't understand, if you feel like you're in a chaotic mess, you need to get before the Creator and let Him divide some things out. Because only he can do it. Can't no counselor do what God can do. No earthly system can do 
what God can do. That's why there are so many people that are hurting and that are broken and they go to these uh, these worldly programs and they go to these man-made systems and it doesn't change anything because there's only one hand that can divide and that's Jesus Christ. The heart is deceitful above all things. But if you read on in that, in that uh, passage there in Jeremiah, it says, who can know the heart of man? And then it goes on and the Lord starts to speak and it says, I search the hearts. Only God can search our hearts. Brother, if you'll bring up the offering basket. The point and the purpose of everything and all things is, first of all, to have a relationship with Jesus Christ. That is it. That, that is our sole purpose, is to be in relationship and right standing with Jesus Christ. But in doing that, there's a second purpose. There's a reason that God is making us. There's a reason that God is forming us, and that is in 2 Timothy 2 and 21. And I sincerely pray that at some point in our lives we do pray this prayer. It says, If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Most of us in here work a secular job or have worked a secular job. And I can tell you there's a little bit of fulfillment in getting up and going to work and providing for your family and contributing. But there's no fulfillment really in working. People get to the age of retirement and they're so ready to quit and they're so ready to just, I'm ready to retire right now. Y'all want to donate to my retirement fund, see me after church, I'll let you. But the work that God causes us to do, you might grow tired, but you'll never go unfulfilled. You might grow weary and well-doing, as the Bible says, but there is coming a reward for that sacrifice that's better than any 401k. Let me tell you, I'll never have a mansion down here, and I'm not speaking bad things. I'm just telling you, I'm real. I know I am never going to have a mansion down here. But if man can create such beautiful things, if we can go, if people will travel thousands of miles to go see the Biltmore, which was built in the 1800s, and a man did that, what has God been doing for the past 3,000 years? What has he been creating for you and I? If man can create that, what is God creating up there? I want to be prepared unto every good work. I want to be ready to go when God says go. I want to be able to speak when God says speak. I want to be able to do when God says do. Amen. Man, we're going to pray over the Sunday school offering this morning. And ask that the Lord would bless it. Lord, we love you so very much. God, we're thankful for your word today, God. Lord, I thank you, God. Lord, that your spirit, God, is able to search the hearts of man, O God. Lord, that you can look down, O God, Lord, and you can divide what needs to be divided, O God. Lord, that you can separate, God, the, the night from the day, O God. Lord, that you can do all things, and all things are in the power of your hands, God. Lord, we give you glory, God. We pray that you would touch our missionaries, God. Lord, touch some missionary right now that's weary, O God. Lord, that feels like giving up, O God. Lord, I pray right now that this financial offering would go to them, God. Lord, that it would uplift their spirits, O God, that you would give them strength for the journey so that souls can be saved. God, touch our missionaries, God. Oh, and we ask it in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, amen.